In this video lecture, we're going to continue on the topic of adolescence and begin the discussion of some cognitive and personality development. Again, I'm limiting the videos to about 10 minutes, so I may have to like abruptly stop and pick up the topic in the next one. The previous video, we were talking about some of the physiological changes and what exactly the definition of adolescence is. Um, and I just want to I want to reiterate or reinforce the notion that adolescence is considered to be this period in between childhood, childhood and adulthood, and it is a social construct. I recently watched a great video that was talking about how adolescence is such a cool period of life because of the goal here is this risks and opportunities that be, that because young people are still attached to their family they're still attached to their parents it creates a perfect opportunity for them to explore and to try new things and so some of the criticisms that you may hear in our pop culture um, about adolescents that they're risky and they don't think things through according to this um, psychologist her argument was this is exactly what you're supposed to be doing because our brains are developing very rapidly. Um, one thing that's pointed out is that because we have this very rapid cognitive development, um, that this is a perfect time to try new things. And because you have the safety and the, the security of your family, um, these, these risks or these new things that you're trying are less risky and less dangerous than they might be after you family formed, right? After you have your own children and your own career. So. Anyway, um, moving back over to the chapter outline, we left off at the slide of sex um, and sexual identity. A couple things that I just want to point out here is that in the game of, uh, or in this era of risk and opportunity, that children, young people um, who might be engaging in sexual activity, this can be um, a risky if they haven't thought it out, if they're not using safe sex practices. So your chapter discusses um, some of the data and what these terms mean, right? So uh, there's this presentation of this idea of sexual orientation versus, uh, versus sexual identity. I like to use the example of your orientation is the direction. So if you like to use compasses and Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, right? It's how, it's the direction, it's how you orient your sexual attraction, the things that make you go, hmm, that's appealing. That's what we mean by sexual orientation, right? That's separate from your sexual identity and it's separate from your actual sexual behavior. Um, uh, the, but anyway, so the notion, some of the research tells us or suggests that girls who have a close relationship with their father may delay sexual, uh, may, be, may delay the onset of sexual intercourse. The research tells us or suggests that young people who live in a more open sexual environment may in fact engage in sexual behavior. They, they may have sex younger than, children, than young people who are not exposed to sexual information, but at the same time, and this is what I wanna stress, while they may engage in sexual activity sooner, they're also more likely to use protection. So they're less risky. They may be younger, but they're less risky. Um, and then the difference between lists some of the different um, sexually transmitted infections. In my day, we call them diseases, right? They were STDs or VD, venereal disease. Now we're calling them sex um, infections. Many of, or a handful, which will be with you for the rest of your life. Um, herpes is one, once you get it, you have it forever. And so is HPV or genital warts. So the point is, and then a question that I might ask if we were in a class together is where did you, where do you get your sexual information? Did you have the talk with your parents? Did you get it in school? Do you get it in religion? Do you get it with your peers? Um, the state of Kansas doesn't offer the same sort of sexual education it did back when I was coming through school, um, which makes it potentially problematic. You know, hopefully you're getting that information from somewhere. Uh, some some useful. Okay, so moving on now. I want to talk about cognitive development. You remember cognitive is how we think a couple important points to make about this particular period is we've shifted from what is referred to as formal operation to abstract thought. So in elementary school, things were things were concrete, right? That two plus two. But when we get to middle school, we start to learn how to think abstractly. Um, 
for instance, this was probably when you're picking up like algebra, right? The whole idea of negative numbers in elementary school, the concept of negative numbers would have been difficult for you. It's also, I think, important to understand that if your brain will maximize its cognitive capacity at 25, this is the period that you're ramping up, right? This is the period that you're learning new things very, very quickly. It's also what makes it, you know, developmentally and socially challenging because you're developing things very quickly. Your memory and processing are speeding up, your, uh, your processing speed, your ability to learn new things just really fast. That's all happening during this time of your, your of your physical development. Sometimes it's referred to as egocentric thinking. So I want to talk about what egocentric thinking is. This is um, you know one of the things that teenagers are criticized for. They always think about their self. But again, if we go with the logic that what's happening during this period is we're learning how to be an adult, this makes sense. It makes sense that a young person would be very self very much absorbed in their self, right? That's So adolescent egocentrism is this kind of self-absorption. Or um, your book also talks about the imaginary, um, the imaginary artist or personal fables. No, I'm sorry, imaginary audience. And this is the notion that everyone is watching. I can remember listening to my teenagers come, you know, go through this period, this, this like, everyone knew their business or everyone would be watching them or everyone would notice if they had a pimple or everyone would notice if they didn't have the same shoes. But the thing that, you know, that it's difficult for parents to convince their middle schoolers of is that's not true because they're going to be more absorbed with themselves than they are paying attention to you. I remember my daughter said to me one time, mom, nobody's, nobody's paying attention to you because they're all too concerned about themselves, the wisdom that she has. And then the personal fable, right? The personal fable is the idea that, um, that, that nothing like this has ever happened to anybody else and you can't possibly understand because your experience is so different than mine. And of course, that's not necessarily true, right? We've all, um, that, this, that our experience, that's the personal fable. And then it's also discussed in your textbook, and I think this is an interesting one, is if you compare the um, intellectual development of American young people with worldwide young people. It's the, your textbook dis, or uh, suggests, suggests that when you look, when you cross culturally evaluate intellectual development of Americans around the world, we don't fare very well. We're below average, but yet our grades are above average. And so it, some, some developmental scholars have asked, is this great inflation? Are American schools too easy? Are we awarding or rewarding high grades even though our young people are not intellectually um, a, a material? We're just giving a lot of A's. I would say that my, I don't have an answer for that. My opinion, I don't, I don't have an opinion. Well, my father, my late father would said would have said, absolutely. He was known not to give A's at all because he felt like nobody was as smart as him and nobody knew everything they needed to know. And I probably am all the other, on the other side of that. Moving on. So then we move on to this notion of self-concept versus self-esteem. Your textbook, so, so self-concept is defined as um, what we mean by self-concept is what am I like? right? Who, what am I? Who am I? And during this period, we move from like concrete to abstractions, right? So concrete, I am a middle child to I am a Christian or I am a feminist or I am a, that's, that's it. So at one point, you know, we may have defined our sense of self as I am a fast runner in elementary school. When we're starting to get to middle school, it's becoming more abstract. Um, and it also goes to, uh, we move from what's referred to as fixed to contextual or situational. So I may be, um, uh, you're, the example that we have that I offer in the outline is under some contexts I may be very outgoing, but under other contexts I'm not. So my sense of who I am, my self-concept is more flexible as I get into adolescence and it's less rigid, right? And finally, self-esteem. 
Um, what I think is important about the concept of self-esteem is esteem being how I do I like myself, right? My sense of worth. And as we as we move into adolescence, um, there's a lot of data that's been done on how my sense of self-worth is affected by gender and social class and ethnicity, right? Th up, through, th up through elementary school, they say that especially girls, I think I mentioned this in the last lecture, but especially girls have a fairly positive sense of self. We get into middle school and that starts to, that girls' self-esteem changes. We, as we grow increasingly aware of our peers and the abstractions of social class and begin to compare ourselves to others, we start to see that there are some effects on our social class as well. Poor children begin to internalize those messages. Uh, minority children, children of color begin to internalize those messages. So if we define esteem as how much worth, the worth that I place on myself, we see that, that the worth that I place on myself begins to change during adolescence. For boys, it goes up. For girls, um, it begins to, it goes down. And, you know, you can't help but ask the question or wonder what, why, and what social forces are at play here that would explain these, these changes.